socialist organization and has written and organized particularly on U.S. empire, solidarity with the Palestinian struggle, and black liberation. He co-organized the 2015 Black Palestine Solidarity Statement, which was signed by over 1,100 black scholars, activists, and artists. And with what's going on on our current uh, southern border, which is sort of weird because, I mean, we annexed that whole exactly. piece. But uh, that's another piece of irony. So, Curry, would you? Thank you. Thank So uh, to come back to Community Church of Boston really feels like coming home in a lot of ways. And I realized when coming here and looking at the, the sign downstairs that next year is going to be the 100th anniversary of this space. And it has such an incredible history. Um, and just to, the, the role that it provides to make conversations like this available for the community is really very special. So I'm grateful to be here. I'm always grateful to share space and a stage with my friends in the foundation movement. Yeah. Um, and I'm really happy to see you all. Um, and to have a conversation about uh, what I think is really one of the, the most pressing issues of our time, not only for us in this particular place, but like, like climate change, the question of migration faces every single country in the world. It's, it's both a question of um, domestic uh, concern and global concern, no matter where you are in the world. So this is a really urgent question that I'm happy to talk to you all about, even though the, the subject is, is most of it's not happy, frankly. And I think we have to start with the, the 7,000 people who are trapped at the border, um, who are refugees, who have rights as refugees, and those rights are being denied. And their arrival to the southern border of the US for the politicians of this country, <laughs> that has not been an opportunity to have a conversation about compassion or welcome, but the opposite. Uh, so as we know, for over a month, the, the federal government was shut down over a dispute between the Republicans and the Democrats um, about funding for border security. But the debate, if you can call it that, was about whether to spend $5.7 billion on border security or the alternative, $1.3 billion on border <laughs> security. And so the debate's all, it's already so, so right-wing. Um, and yep. people maybe heard a couple days ago, Nancy Pelosi, um, who's heading the Democrats in the House, said that um, they don't want to approve money for a wall, but that they would be open to funding what she called enhanced fencing. Enhanced fencing. And you may remember a couple months ago, President Trump talked about how the wall doesn't have to be concrete, but it could be made of steel slats. <laughs> so it's like if the conversation is about the building materials, like if that's the debate, <laughs> we've already lost. Uh, and by we, I mean humanity. Like humanity is already lost. Um, so it can't be about that. And uh, what I want to do is, is to say a word about what's behind the crisis and then what the left and progressives should be for, which I think is a position that honors humanity. Um, and I, I, um, I want to kind of lay out some things and then open up a bit of a conversation as well. So hopefully we won't talk too long. 
Um, but first, just to say, just to kind of center this conversation in the, the United States, um, we tend to see things in a very US-centric way. Um, and of course, we have a president at the moment who thinks that everything that he says is from his, his personal genius. Uh, <laughs> but the fact is, neither what Trump is saying, nor the question of um, whether or not to welcome refugees, these are not just US questions. Uh, it's a global phenomenon. There are one billion migrants in the world today. One seventh of the planet's population is migrants. Uh, the majority of those people are actually not international migrants. They're considered internal migrants, which is another thing to kind of get your head around. Um, but of, the, of that group of people, of that billion people, 68.5 million people, according to the United Nations, are forcibly displaced. Um, and of those, 25 million are refugees. So again, the majority of people who are displaced are even displaced within the borders of their home nation. Uh, but then 25 million are displaced across borders, according to the UN. It's actually a, a lower estimate, which again, I want to talk about in a second. When we talk about what displaces people, there are three main factors. Uh, the first is military and political conflict, obviously. You know, I think that when we think of refugees, that's what we think about. Um, and of course, uh, it, it calls to mind um, places like Afghanistan, Syria, Palestine, the Congo, Somalia, Ethiopia, the Rohingya who've been displaced from Burma. Um, actually, the, the millions of people who are leaving Venezuela also are being, you know, the, the political situation there um, is something that's displacing people. So that's one thing. There's also the question of economic devastation, the inability to make a living where you are. And then, of course, ecological disaster. And when we think about the uh, actually unknown number of Puerto Ricans who were displaced after Hurricane Maria, unknown because the US federal government and other institutions don't keep track, actually, uh, but it's in the hundreds of thousands of people who have left the island, that was sparked by the hurricanes and really the political failure by the United States to do anything uh, to protect people. Uh, according to the UN last year, one and a half times more people were displaced by ecological disaster than by conflict. Wow. Which, if you consider that, actually should reframe what our idea of a refugee is. Yeah. Um, and that number, unfortunately, uh, is growing because yeah. of climate change. So um, it's, a, it's really important to consider these factors because in the US, among the many, bizarre things about this country. Uh, when, when we talk about migrants and particularly refugees, like the thousands who've arrived at the southern border, the conversation is limited to what to do with these people once they've arrived. And there's virtually no conversation about why thousands of people would collectively uproot themselves and leave their homes and come to, on a perilous journey yeah. to a different place. And uh, if you look at those factors, military conflict and kind of political repression, environmental devastation, and economic devastation, the United States actually plays a critical role in all three of those all around the world. So, um, uh, like I said, this question is a question that's facing, I think, everybody in the world. And um, frankly, the conversation happening elsewhere should be a familiar one to us. Actually, um, most of the world is, is not responding in a compassionate way, or in a way that's based on solidarity. I should say most of the states of the world, most of the world's governments. Um, there are, uh, there have been challenges to those governments by ordinary people around the world. That's important to highlight. But to start with the governments, since 2015, there have been border barriers erected in Hungary, Macedonia, Greece, Bulgaria, Austria, Slovenia, and unfortunately the list could go on. Um, it's also not accidental that different states have responded similarly around the world because they actually inspire each other. There's this person who's uh, the interior minister of Italy right now named Matteo Salvini, um, who uh, is going on this rabid campaign against migrants, uh, particularly African migrants in Italy. 
And the campaign slogan for his party, which is called the Northern League, a longtime racist party in Italy, their campaign slogan in last year, 2018, was Italians first, directly inspired by the America First slogan um, from Donald Trump. And actually, I encourage you, if you can stomach it, to um, look up at some point Matteo Salvini's uh, campaign sign, which he modeled after Donald Trump's campaign sign. So they inspire each other. Uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, who is the right-wing demagogue um, in, in control of that country at the moment, but the head of state there, uh, he blamed the influx of migrants who come to Europe on uh, George Soros, the uh, liberal billionaire um, philanthropist and investor. Um, and he said that the entire uh, movement of millions of people to Europe was orchestrated by George Soros, which not only is false and not only actually part of a long-standing anti-Semitic trope based in Europe, and in Hungary in particular, about George Soros is Jewish, about this kind of secret conspiracy of Jews orchestrating world events, but it's also parallel to what um, Donald Trump said about the Democrats orchestrating the migrant caravans, that somehow the Democrats you know, created this whole, this whole thing. Um, so again, it's not accidental that those two things are similar. The last example I'll, I'll give is there's this uh, refugee camp that I've um, uh, been a bit preoccupied with called Ruthban uh, in Syria. It's, uh, it's in Syria on the Jordanian border. And it's basically exactly the situation in Tijuana where thousands of people who have, they, they, were, they were leaving Syria and trying to get into Jordan and they got stuck. And now they're just in this makeshift camp. Um, you know, in Tijuana at the moment, there are over 7,000 refugees in that situation. In this camp, it's more like uh, 15,000. Um, and they're in the desert. They have uh, nothing, and, and they're, they're, they're trying to survive. Well, the Jordanian government, the reason why they gave as to why these people fleeing Syria would not be allowed into Jordan is that among them, that, that they're fleeing areas that have been strongholds for ISIS. And so ISIS has infiltrated these refugees, and therefore we can't let them into Jordan because then that'll be a way for, for ISIS members to come into Jordan. This is like when Donald Trump and others here say that the people who are in the migrant caravans from Central America are fleeing places where there is gang activity, and therefore it's a way for MS-13 and other gang members to come into the United States, right. when in fact they are fleeing the gang violence, right. which, for what it's worth, um, MS-13 is not just, the, the story of that, you know, violent, vicious gang is not just a story of Central America, it's actually a story of the United States. Yeah, yeah. That gang was incubated in the prisons of California in the early 1990s when Central Americans were locked up, and those people were deported back to Central America. So that gang actually, its origins lie in the mass incarceration and deportation machine of the United States. Similarly, among, for these Syrians who are fleeing um, this area of Syria called Raqqa, who ended up on the border of Jordan, Raqqa was bombed severely by the United States. So again, it's the U.S. actually that's implicated, and it's these migrants, these refugees who pay the price for the crimes of, of the U.S. So um, uh, that's kind of all the bad news. And um, you know, the, the title of this talk was something like, um, something about the permanent crisis of refugees. It, the, the origins of it came when I was studying, this is part of my, um, my job, a researcher of this, uh, this, this think tank called the Institute for Policy Studies. And I was, um, I was just looking at these various populations of people displaced all around the world and thinking, okay, they're, they're, they're stuck in these camps on borders. In particular, I was thinking about this group of people, the Rohingya, who are an ethnic and religious minority in Burma. Um, uh, whose ancestral origins lie in, in South Asia. Um, and, uh, and so after being terrorized in Burma, they were essentially expelled to Bangladesh. And then Bangladesh is now expelling them back to Burma. Um, and uh, various countries have refused to take them in. And so I thought, you have these populations of people who are displaced, and the governments of the world don't have a solution to this crisis. The more I thought about it, the more I learned the, about it, the more I realized, no, this actually is their solution. The solution is to keep a permanent and growing population of, of, of refugees that have no place to go. Um, and once you consider that, you consider, you, you learn about 
there, there are camps, for example, in East Africa, in Ethiopia, um, and in Kenya, where people spend their entire lives, actually. I mean, the, the, the definition of the term refugee, it's a displaced person that's supposed to be a temporary condition, but actually, there are people who are permanent refugees. And um, the big example that comes to mind for me, probably for many of you, is Palestine, actually. This is a permanent refugee situation. The, the camps that my friends and comrades visited in the West Bank, these camps were built to house people temporarily before they could return to their home in what is now called Israel. But of course, they're, they're, those, those what were supposed to be temporary structures, now permanent structures, generations of people have grown up in Dehisha and other um, refugee camps. So that is, I believe, the solution of the people in power around the world. And it's worth saying that this question of forced uh, migration of expelled people, of refugees, it is obviously uh, the violence that's being carried out is obvious, obviously to people like us, um, being led by um, politicians in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, that is the historically colonizing countries. But it must be said, it's not only there. The Dominican Republic has expelled Haitians. Um, the South African state has been um, repressive to other Africans who sought to migrate um, to Africa. The Kenyan state has been vicious to Somalis using the kind of Islamophobic rhetoric that the United States uses, et cetera. So this is a global issue. So um, I think that we should be for open borders, which at the moment in the US is considered like an insult. <laughs> I mean, they're like, you're for open borders, you know, that's that's meant to discourage um, you know, progressives. And I think that we should embrace like we are for open borders. Borders shouldn't exist actually. Um, there's no basis to oppose migration with the idea that people from who happen to be born on one side of the line are somehow more dangerous or more of a threat than anybody else. Um, I remember a few years back, um, Charlie Baker, who for some reason is considered a progressive uh, by a lot of people in Massachusetts, you know, this Republican governor. He, yeah, well, yeah, that is Boston Globe and others. You know, he, he joined other um, Republican governors across the country and said that um, Syrian refugees would not be allowed in Massachusetts in 2015. 30 governors have said that. What's that? 30 governors have said no Syrian. Yeah, my when I when I get to my conclusion, it's about like of the U.S. But so right, right, that makes but whatever scary. you know. But yeah, it's like this. Anyway, what what kind of society do we want to live in is also I think yes. the guiding yes. question. But um, but but so Charlie Baker, um, you know, he said those Syrians were not welcome here, and um, you know, um, a bunch of us organized a rally on the state house steps, um, and I remember this reporter came up to me and. She was like, yeah, but you know, don't you think that there should be some screening to make sure that dangerous people can't get into Massachusetts? And I was like, do we screen people from New Hampshire? <laughs> like, they're across the border, but some, somehow that's which, you know, I avoid New Hampshire, but whatever, anyway. <laughs> but but, but well, why, why, are some, why are some borders, you know, considered, um, why is it that we, we take some borders seriously in a way that actually the question of what rights you have are based on your location relative to borders. But other borders are not thought about like that at all. And I don't think there's any reason to see the US-Mexico border as any different from the Cambridge-Somerville border. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so that's, that's, uh, that, that's what I think we should be for. Um, and um, let, me, let me conclude, because I, I do want to I have more of a conversation, but just a few kind of bullet points to consider. Um, so I'll just kind of drop these, and we can explore them if you'd like. Uh, so one is in under, our understanding of migration. I think that we have to incorporate an understanding of colonialism. Um, if we are talking about the question of Puerto Rico, for example, which is colonized by the United States, it's a country that has not been allowed to be a country for five centuries. It is currently. Um, uh, controlled by the U.S. Puerto Ricans don't have the right to control their own borders, uh, by the way, um, or their currency, or any of the, the or their budget, or, or anything like that. Um, those decisions are all made in Washington, D.C., um, in a Congress where Puerto Rico does not have voting representation, <coughs> by the way. 
Uh, well, all three factors, military conflict, where it was heavily militarized and, and political control by the United States, the question of the economy, which has been devastated for years, and then ecological crisis, they all intersect at Puerto Rico. And I mentioned earlier that while there are 25, according to the UN, there are over 25 million refugees in the world, Puerto Ricans who are displaced from the island and come to the United States are not considered refugees because U.S. citizenship was forced upon them, and so that's considered internal migration. That's not considered displacement from a different country. In fact, they are from a different country. So I think we have to have an anti-colonial critique. Um, number two, especially in the U.S., though not exclusively here, we have to incorporate a race, an understanding of race, in particular anti-black racism, and its place in the question of, of migration. Um, and I think this is for many reasons. One is in the U.S., we should always be thinking about anti-black racism because it's at the foundation of the country. But if we're talking about the current um, crisis at the border, the ability of the U.S. government to detain en masse so many people immediately is because of the mass incarceration machine that has been built up on this side of the border, yes. whose you know, first primary target was the black population and the brown population as well. Um, that's why they're able to construct a detention camp overnight, is they already have the know-how, the technology, the materials, and, and so on. Um, they say that it's somehow impossible to process all these asylum applications, but it's incredibly easy to build migrant detention camps and expand existing prison facilities. That's because of mass incarceration, and we have to talk about the treatment of black folks uh, with that. Also, Donald Trump has talked about stripping birthright citizenship away from um, second generation migrants, which itself is a horrendous proposal, but also if we're talking about birthright citizenship, the notion that by virtue of being born here, you are a citizen of this country, that was fought for and won by a slave revolt called the Civil War. It was the 14th <laughs> Amendment you know, that, that was established to, to extend that to black people. And again, not, that wasn't given benevolently, it, was, it took a war to win that right. Um, and so it is an attack, obviously, on migrants and the, the children of migrants, but it's also an attack on black people. Um, and that is, I think, not only why people who are concerned with migration should be also concerned with the question of anti-black racism, but also black people and people who are concerned with our oppression and liberation should be concerned with the question of migration. And that, of course, is the basis for solidarity. It's the understanding that while we might experience the world differently, we might be treated differently by the same system, our fates are bound together. And we have to recognize that. Um, point number three, we have to talk about the question of indigenous peoples as well. And the fact that all of this land is so and So, so the, the place where, I mean, it's so strange for you know, like right wingers in San Diego to say like, you know, those people should they don't belong here and they're gonna come here and speak Spanish and it's like you live in a place called San Diego, California. Like why do you think it's called that? Um, so before that place was called the United States, it was called Mexico, and before it was called that, it was called it was belonged to the Pueblo Nation and many other nations um, that, that exist um, that predate nation not only this nation state but nation states in general. And in fact, many of the people who are coming from Central America and the migrant caravans are themselves indigenous peoples yeah. whose nations and whose stories well predate the borders of this, this, you know, these United States and the other borders that they crossed. Um, and so I think that we have to talk about that too. Um, I already said what we have to talk about. Palestine, I mean, it's like truthfully, Israel 